I said a little earlier that if we had everybody down front, I would preach a little shorter tonight. College kids were already down here. I think that's pretty amazing. They're always up front. Craig's helping all he can. <laughs> you ready for the closing prayer? But no. Tonight, uh, I've got a lesson that I've, I found on the internet. A good friend of mine uh, preached it back some time ago. A lot of times, um, when I'm at intervals where I don't want to start something I'm planning because it's coming up soon, I'll do a little research and figure out something that can use as one or two little injection lessons, you might call them or whatever. I'm just going to put it here and, and let it be its own standalone lesson without tying it into a series. And a lot of times I'll, I'll get on the internet and I'll do some searching on some friends and things that they preached on and I'll catch an idea from a lesson and I'll take it and do something totally different. But I didn't do that. Uh, I started listening to this lesson on lightning and I thought, well, that's unique. I wonder where he's going to go with that. He preached about lightning. And I started taking notes and I kept thinking, I'm waiting for the, the connection. There's a parallel. And he preached on lightning all the way through. So Glenn Colley, I'm preaching a lesson on lightning tonight, mostly from things he said, changing a few things as I always take advantage of doing. But it starts out in James chapter 1, verse 19. I think a good place to start as we're looking at what's going on here. As James is talking about God and, and what he does for us and how he cares for us. And so James writes this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And people pondered that whole concept of the shadow of turning, but I never stopped and talked about or thought about the Father of lights as in plural. And, uh, of course, if you're looking at that, you can really quickly understand that God not only said, let there be light, but there was light even before the sun. So he is a father or an originator of lights. And the, and the stars and the moon, the reflection of the sun, etc., which is the moon, and, and many other things are obviously all originations uh, or creations of God. But included in that, you could also count lightning as he is an originator of lightning. You might not have ever thought about it that, but there's a couple points that uh, Glenn Colley pulls out, and I quickly jotted them down because I thought they were rather unusual. Every second of existence, there is a lightning bolt somewhere. Now, this is some scientific study that's come out somewhere that he's discovered. Somewhere on Earth, since we've started this le lesson, lightning has appeared somewhere in some location. Now, lightning may not just come down in the times of thunderstorms, but also sometimes in snowstorms there have been lightning. But 1.4 billion times per year, lightning hits and covers, in fact, some part of the whole earth just about any time. Weather predictions are made quite regularly, usually oftentimes 60 to 75 percent correct, maybe about that. But here's something that you probably are very well aware of that's hard to predict lightning. It may or may not happen. It could be. There are conditions for it. But they can't predict lightning nearly as well as they can the rain, which we have questions about at times anyway. But as we're looking at the idea of lightning, it's interesting to recognize right off the bat, and you know this, that God is not only the originator of lightning, but he controls lightning. Psalm 148, verse 8, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds, all fulfilling his word, and including in that, of course, all the weather, is lightning. Matthew chapter 5, as Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount, and he talks about how we should be imitators of God and not like the rest of the world, but rather treating people equally, whether you like them or don't like them. And verse 45 says, That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God is controlling weather. Now that's a principle there, and from that we can extract also the idea that he controls the lightning. 
Job chapter 36 and verse 25. As Job is making a, a discussion here between friends and Job, etc., and God is about to intercede in chapter 38. We'll come to that a little later. But uh, there's a comment made that says, Indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds or the thunder from his canopy? Now, thunder comes when there's lightning. You may see lightning and not hear thunder, but somebody does if they're close enough to have picked up on it. But we serve a God that controls the weather. Now, it might leave a question in your mind to how much does he control the weather? And um, Glenn Colley, matter of fact, he said he used to ponder that sometimes. Does God just push a button and say we're in auto drive and let it roll for itself except on occasions? Or does he distinctly select and do certain things here and there? Well, again, we're not too sure how that all comes about, but we do know God has power and control, and he does control the weather. Which leads us to the next point, and that is that lightning itself declares the power of God. One lightning bolt, according to scientists, have one billion volts of electricity just in one lightning strike. If you can imagine, what could we do with a billion volts of electricity? Uh, it's a good thing there are some kite flyers of times past who, quote, discovered electricity or forms of it. Wasn't shocked by that, but somehow had a grounding system and I guess knew enough about that. But that one billion volts is a power. A tremendous power that God has control over. Now, we don't. We can't control it. It's unpredictable. But just think about what could we do if we could even just begin to harness some portion, use, steer, direct anything about lightning and what could be done out of that. In thinking about God and the power that he has, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says this, For since the creation of the world, he is speaking about God, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Speaking about now about the world. But as you're thinking or pondering just the, the, the concept of lightning and the power that it is, there's a declaration that God has power over that, which will automatically cause to mind to think about how great God is and the attributes that he has. In the book of Exodus, in chapter 8 and verse 18, there's a discussion going on between, uh, well, the whole section here, of course, God causing plagues to come about on, on Pharaoh. Uh, but some of this the magicians are dealing with at the very early times of the plagues. You remember reading through that if you have. And notice that uh, there's the first couple of plagues that come along that it says, but the magicians were able to do the same. As if to say, well, they just kind of pass that off as a good magic trick or something. Uh, but in chapter 8, verse 18, there's a change that takes place. And I don't know if it's the severity or just the fact that they couldn't keep up with the consistency of what was going on. But when God sends another plague, it says, Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So they were, there were lice on men and beasts. And then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Like before, we could do this. And so Pharaoh kept kind of dismissing things. But now, all of a sudden, even the magicians or those who felt they had some kind of special powers, whether it be satanic or just magical or whatever, uh, nonetheless, now they're attributing something even greater is coming from the power of God. That God is able to control things. Now, we're, we're talking here just about control issues. We'll get down to the idea of lightning here in just a minute. If you move on down to chapter 31 of Exodus... And verse 18, it says, When he had made an end to speaking with them on Mount Sinai, speaking about now Moses, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony. Ten Commandments, of course. Tablets of stone written with the finger of God. There's a power that seems to be being suggested that is, is so majestic, now it's like the hand of God is being involved. 
as we go back to the, the plagues that are going on. This is the finger of God that's taking place. And the, the ten tablets now are written with the finger of God. There's direction and power that's being described. One other attribute, uh, one other connection with that is uh, Psalm 8 and verse 3. Uh, as the psalmist is writing about uh, God and, and how great and awesome is his name. And then he says in verse 3, he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. And the next verse says, I ask myself, what is man that you would be mindful of him? All of these verses connecting in with the idea of God and his, his power and majesty over the earth. When you move to the book of Job, as Job is having a discussion between his so-called friends, who really I guess you could say were friends, who came to visit with him, came to encourage him to start with, also came to call him to repentance because uh, they felt like there was something going on in Job's life that must be attributed to some kind of deep sin. Hidden if it was, but nonetheless, God wouldn't be doing or punishing Job the way they perceived it if it wasn't for Job having some problems. So there's a great deal of discussion that goes on through a majority of the book of Job between Job's friends and Job trying to defend himself and saying he's not uh, as his friends were declaring. After a bit of time, Job begins to pretty much a defense about he and God, or he with God. And he starts this ongoing discussion is with, God, why have you done this to me? If you would just speak out, I would declare my innocence as if to say, now Job is ready to just do discussion battle with God. And God listens for a little while, understanding, I guess, uh, the concern of Job and, and God's patience being demonstrated. But in chapter 38 in the book of Job, God speaks out. And he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And then God goes on and describes all the things that take place that he has control over. And directs and does. And then verses 34 and 35 in that chapter. God says this. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds? That an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings? That they may go? And they say to you. Here we are. And as we pause in this little bit of a phrase coming from God now here about what he does and the control he has, it's almost as if to say lightning is like a soldier or a servant of God. When God calls for a lightning to come out, the lightning bolts stand up and say, here we are, God, tell me where you want to go. Kind of like we say about the, the drill sergeants or whatever, you know, when they say jump, you say how high. It's, I'm here at your command, at your beckon, tell me. God controlling lightning. Now, does he do it on a regular basis or is it an autopilot? Uh, that one again is up to God, I guess you could say. But as we're seeing here, all that's taking place here, we're serving a God that is majestically powerful. A lightning bolt every second somewhere on this earth. One billion bolts of power striking consistently. 1,001. 1,002, 1,003, in some part of the world. And that's power as we think about it. And God commands these and they report to him. Now as we're looking at all of this, here's where we come down to where the rubber meets the road here and, and just dealing with this. Uh, my, my friend uh, Glenn Colley comments, he said, I wouldn't want to fall into the hands of an angry God. I would add to that but I would want to be close by to seek his protection and his guidance in the same arena. Lightning hitting close, and, and if you've ever been where lightning has struck ex extremely close, there, there's almost a percussion that's felt. It, 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 not only do you hear it, you feel it. It, it shakes the ground and, and, and rattles the air, actually. Uh, whether you hear a sound or you're deaf or not, I think you could pick up on the percussion of that. 
I don't remember if it was Arch Trimble or someone told me back some time ago that uh, they, they knew someone that saw a lightning strike across a lake. And it was just a few moments later that he felt a tingling in his feet, standing on a dock, which was sitting down in the water. And he felt the repercussion of the lightning bolt that hit on the other side. Soon after, I think it was a friend of his, had struck down right there next to him. Why one and the other not? But, but nonetheless, the power that's been going on in there, and you, you think about um, some of the things within the Old Testament. Uh, examples, for instance, in Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 and 17. As now Moses is coming up to Mount Sinai, and the uh, description goes on like this, that it came to pass that on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all of the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now there's a discussion that takes place because they're not supposed to touch the mountain. Well, the people saw all the action, saw the lightning, saw the clouds, felt everything happening, and they were concerned, they were worried. They, did, they didn't want to come close to God. Matter of fact, in chapter 20, there's a response from the people. Verses 18 and 19. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood afar off. They weren't even going to come close. And they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we'll hear you. But let not God speak to us lest we die. So they had a certain fear because of the thunderings and the lightning and the power that they could see in the majesty of God. But I also think about the other side of this, the fact that Moses walked onto that mountain to receive guidance and direction and protection from God. Same lightning, same power being distributed here. And why one man decides for himself, or decides because of God's direction, that this is where I need to be. So when I look at the display of what's going on, whether we have a thunderstorm today or a snowstorm tomorrow, and we see God directing all the things that are happening, the hard freezes or the snows or the ice storms, I think of the power of God that's going on, and I think of the control He has, but I also think of His guidance and His protection. And it makes me want to draw closer to the mountain and not run away from it because there is not only where the power and the thunder is, but there is where my God is. And if you'll remember one other thing about Moses, after he went up on the mountain and he came back, he was changed. Now he didn't recognize that, but for being in the presence of God, his face was glowing. And the people now feared Moses because of what he had. But what a difference respecting God and being in his presence makes. Whether he has thunder and lightnings or, or not, our, our respect for him is, is on a terms of, I want that Father. I seek that guidance. Not that I'm scared to be with Him, but more feel comfortable being protected and taken care of Him. No, yes, I, I, I do not want to fall in the hands of an angry God. If I'm on the wrong side, I don't want that. I want what is right. I do what I hope is correct with God in abidance with His Word. And therefore, the thunder and the lightning aren't situations that cause me to fear as much as draw closer to Him. And such is the, the message from the idea of lightning here. But as you're thinking about this, again, just recapping what's happening here. Number one, we see a display that's going on, whether it's thunder or lightning or power, and it demonstrates God's power. It demonstrates also that God is protecting and guiding and giving us a protection that, that continues on in our life as, as weather has continued ever since the world has ever begun. Weather changes. Don't think about just the weatherman. Think about the God that controls, the God that directs, and the God that protects. We'll close the lesson tonight about lightning. 
something to think about. Look out in the world and see what's happening. Now, as you look at your life, just remember there's a God out there. And we close the lesson again with an invitation. Are you struggling? Don't fear the lightning, but seek the God that controls it. Not right with God might be a reason to be fearful, but also a reason to come forward and to make that right. We serve an awesome God, a God that controls all that, but a God that wants us with Him in heaven and wants us here on this earth caring for one another. And we care for you. You need help? Come forward while we sing. Please come.